Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Welcome, everybody, to today's Building My Legacy podcast. I have with me today David Friedman. David has a company called CultureWise, and he is an expert in building cultures in organizations. So we're going to talk a little bit about why building cultures is important. But um, just to give you a little bit more of a background about David, He's an award-winning CEO, entrepreneur, author, and renowned public speaker. He's published um, a couple of books, one fundamentally different, and the other is Culture by Design. And so we like to have things by design. It doesn't always happen that way, does it? True. This is true. So just to get started, David, would you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to working with culture? Why that? Yeah, good question. And I would say, Lois, to a great extent, it was really accidental. And what I mean by that is that, so I had spent 27 years as the CEO of, of all things, an employee benefits consulting company. And we grew that company from a couple people to over a hundred people. And during the years that we were growing that company, we were really successful in almost every dimension you can look at, but the foundation of all the success that we had, I mean, everything that made us unique and successful was the culture that we had built in that company. It was everything for us. And as the CEO of the company, I did a lot of things in a very intentional way to make that happen. And when I sold the company, I eventually sold the company, ended up writing my first of a couple of books about, actually three books now, but the first of my three books about what we had done in our company that helped us to be so successful. And I really, I'm always honest about this. I wrote that book, Lois, actually as a closure step. It wasn't written to launch something. It was a closure step to put that career behind me and do something totally different. And what ended up happening is people got a lot of value from the book and the book led to people asking me to speak. And as people asked me to speak, people said, hey, could I hire you to help me? And next thing I knew, I was launched into the second career. But it wasn't my plan. It wasn't your plan. But obviously, culture was something that you have passion about. So you talk about the ROI that goes with culture. Culture is... Um, so let's talk about that. And then I want to talk about is culture leader specific? Mm. Yeah. So let's start with, with, you know, the ROI. So I would say that in its simplest form, and to me, this doesn't have to be complicated. We all know that in any organization, and, and, and I'm going to call an organization, a group of humans. So that organization could be a company typically, but it could be a group of friends it could be a family, it could be a church group and a sports team. In any group of people that comes together, cultures form. And the culture in a group has an enormous influence over how everybody does what they do. You know, I think in companies, I think of people as existing largely in the typical bell curve that you often see, where on one end of the spectrum, you've got I'm going to say five or 10% of people who I like to call these people rock stars. These are the people you could put these people anywhere and they're going to stand out because that's just who they are. And on the other end of the spectrum, you've got the opposite. You've got five or 10% of people who aren't going to be very good no matter where you put them. But in between, and here's the real point, in between, you've got about 80% of your people who will go with the flow. In other words, these people will be influenced by the culture that they're operating in. So put these people in a high performing environment and they're going to look around and figure out even unconsciously that I guess that's what they expect here. And they'll raise their, elevate their level of play beyond what they might somewhere else. And you put the exact same people. And this is the key thing. You take those same people, that 80% with whatever their skills or talent or ability is, you put those people in a low performing environment, they're going to sink to the level of the people around them. Because the environment influences everything. So that means when we talk about ROI, 
it influences how productive they are, how much of their discretionary effort they put in, how they deal with customers. It influences whether they even come to work for you in the first place and whether they stay with you in the workplace. And there's ROI on that. It influences how much drama or dysfunction is in the organization or how highly effective they are. It influences how successfully you execute execute on your initiatives or your strategy. I mean, there's a, a famous quote that many of our listeners have probably heard many times. Peter Drucker once said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's an overused trite quote. But his point in saying that was that no matter how good your strategy is or, or your products or service, if you've got a messed up dysfunctional group of people, you're not going very far with it. And if you've got a highly functioning group of people, you're going to take that strategy and you're going to go three, four, five, ten times as far with that strategy. It's all driven by the culture. So back to my other question, is culture leader specific? Well, I would say that it can be, Lois. And the way that I, I would frame that is that I say that the leader of the organization is the chief cultural officer of the organization. In other words, he or she is the one that that has the opportunity to most influence the culture. However, if that leader isn't, well, I guess you could say it this way, if they're not purposely creating it, they're still creating it even by omission because they're allowing the culture to emerge by whoever it emerges to. I think of it this way that I sometimes say it like this, absent an intentional force on your part as a leader. In other words, if you as a leader aren't purposely taking control and creating the culture that you want, it's going to get created anyway. It's not like it's not going to happen. It's going to get created and it's going to mostly be influenced by those people in the organization who just happen to have the strongest personalities. See, in every group of people, there are alpha people. You know this. I know that you're disc trained. So there's going to be the influencers in every group. And left to their own devices, these, these higher influential people will create the culture, even unconsciously. They're still doing it just by the, the nature of their personality, and everybody else follows suit. And the reason that, that I like to point this out is if we understand how important the culture is to driving success... Well, then as a leader, I don't want to leave that to the whims of the strongest personalities. If it's that influential, that's just luck. I mean, maybe you got really good people that are influencers and maybe you got jerks who are influencers and we don't want to leave it to that. So as a leader, I ought to take control over that. It ought to be leader specific because as the leader, I'm creating a vision of what is the organization I want to build. That's my responsibility as a leader is to create that vision. And the culture is an important part of that vision. So it is important. We see the, re, the impact in terms mm -hmm. of the results. Why, what is it that prevents leaders from being intentional about culture? Mm, that's a good question. I would say several things. I'd say the first thing, Lois, is that most leaders don't think of culture as something you can be intentional about. In other words, many, if not most leaders, see culture as this soft, touchy-feely, well, it would be nice if everybody treats each other well and we had this nice place. And so it's this squishy kind of thing that they've not really thought of that you could be more systematic or more intentional about it. That it, there's a there's a thing that I do, this will make sense to you, in some of the, the speaking engagements that I do to CEO groups, I'll, I'll say to CEOs, I'll ask them, all right, on a one to five scale, where would you rate the importance of culture, the impact of culture on the bottom line? So forget the fluff, you know, the real hardcore financial impact. Um, with one being, it's not that big a deal, and five being, it's a really big deal, it's really insignificant. And I go around the room and I ask people to rate it. And almost everybody among CEOs these days will give it a five. I'll give a couple of fours and I always get at least one six or seven on a five point scale. Um, so they get that it's important. And then I ask them, okay, 
How many of you in this room, these CEOs and your listeners could do the same? How many of you have some systematic, some documented plan for your strategic initiatives for the year, you know, your, strat- your strategic plan for the year? And most of them have that. And I ask them, how many of you have some kind of a documented sales plan for your, your sales targets and quotas and how you're going to hit your numbers? And they have that. And I say to them, I'm sure you, know, you all have some financial plan. We're not running our company without a budget or a forecast. Of course, they have that. And then I ask them, how many of you have some kind of a written documented culture plan for how you're driving your company? There's culture. Almost, maybe less than 10% of them do. So I say, well, let me see if I get this right. You just told me this was a five in terms of its importance to the bottom line. It's real financial impact. And most of us are just winging it, hoping it's going to work out. And it's kind of fascinating because they've never thought about it that way. And then when I ask them to your question, why? So why don't we have a plan? Most of them either have never thought about it. It is too squishy for them. They've never learned how to do it. They think of, they know if they went to business school, they learned how to look at, you know, forecasts and do sales and operations, those real business things, you know, the hardcore financial things that we can talk about that stuff all day, but talk about the people part. I don't know what to do about any of that. So they stay in their comfort zone. It's uncomfortable. It's squishy for most. And so they tend to avoid it because it's not something they know what to do with. So I think that's why they avoid it and they don't know how to do it. So how do you move them from knowing it's important to not having a plan to being intentional about it? What's the process? How do you take them from one, basically, Mm -hmm. to the five that they aspire towards? Well, that's a good question. And I would say the the starting point is to help them understand that they can and should be intentional about their culture and systematic. And then it's a question of introducing them to the methodology that I really teach. And I think the key to it is, this sounds kind of crazy, but it has to be simple and practical. If it's too complicated, or it sounds too lofty. It sounds like, oh, that sounds great, but who's got time for that? I'm too busy. And so nothing happens. So when you can explain it to them in a way that's really simple and logical so that they could say in their own minds, you know what, Lois, what you just said to me makes a heck of a lot of sense. That's pretty logical. When it's explained in that way, it's easy for them then to move from I don't, you know, I know it's important, but I don't have any plan for it to, oh, you've given me an easy construct for how to think about and understand it in a clearer, more practical way. When you can give people a clear, practical approach, they say, oh, that makes sense. Sure. Why wouldn't I do that? Right. And I think that's the key. So I think a lot of things that we do in consulting, coaching often doesn't work because we make it. We, we feel smarter and like we've mm-hmm. delivered more value when we make it complicated. Yes. And when we make it complicated, nobody can communicate it to the next group. Of yes. People, and so it gets lost. Yes. So I, I appreciate that approach of yours. What is it about your process that makes it so pragmatic? How have you structured a, a thing that, um, psychologists often have a hard time getting their arms around, right? Mm-hmm. And put it in, in terms that people can understand and use. Yeah, that's a great question. So let me explain that. And, and, and I'll first say that, you know, I'm with you. It's got to be simple or forget it. And I would add something to that. I think it actually takes greater sophistication to make something simple than to make it complicated. And you're right. So many coaches, consultants, feel at some level as if they're adding value. They're smart. If they can explain something that no one else understands except them, the audience will say, oh my God, she must be really smart because I don't know what she just said. (laughs) And I think it's the opposite. That If you're really smart, you know how to make it simple. So the audience says, oh my God, that's pretty simple. How come I never thought about that before? Um, So to answer the question, how do we do that? So I organize the steps that it takes to be really systematic around a culture around a framework that I call the eight step framework, eight different things. If you do these eight things, this is how you make this happen. But to even further simplify it, 
my experience is that there are two of these eight steps that probably drive 90% of the impact. So if you do these two logical things, you're going to be really successful. And if you don't do these two things, you're not going to get very far. So let me explain for your audience what those two things are, and you'll see the logic behind this. So the first step in really being intentional about a culture is how you define with tremendous clarity exactly what you want your culture to be. Now, the reason I say this is simple and obvious is how could you possibly create a particular culture if you can't tell me what you're trying to create in the first place? And that sounds simple. And yet very few companies do this well. They have lofty visions and missions and core values that look wonderful on the website, but really don't bring enough clarity. When we talk about how to bring that clarity, I depart from many people in that I make a distinction between what I call values and what I call behaviors, because I think they're very different. A value to me is an abstract concept, quality, integrity, service, loyalty, respect, et cetera. A behavior in contrast is an action. It's something I can see people doing. So for example, some of the behaviors that I teach in my own company are things like honor commitments, practice blameless problem solving, get clear on expectations, be a fanatic about response time. These are actions that people do. So a value is an abstract idea, behavior is an action. The reason that distinction is relevant and not just semantics is that because values tend to be so abstract, they can mean so many different things to different people that they become very difficult to operationalize. It's hard to coach somebody about their values. Behaviors, though, because they're action-oriented, are a lot easier to teach and coach and guide and give people feedback about. So so I teach companies to define their culture, not in terms of a broad, nebulous set of values, but rather in terms of the behaviors that you say as a leader, if we could get our people to do these things more consistently, we're going to be even more successful than we've ever done. And, And I give those behaviors a name. It's just my own nomenclature. I call them fundamentals because I think they're fundamental to success. So step number one of these two critical steps is defining more clearly in terms of behaviors, what do I want this culture to be? Now, the second step is really the game changer. The second step is what I call creating rituals. So a ritual in the way that I use this word is a routine. It's like a habit, something that we do over and over and over again. And the reason that rituals are really important and you know this, is that in the absence of something becoming a routine, a ritual, a habit, we get all kinds of great ideas and we get all excited. And after two months, we get really busy and it doesn't last anymore, whether it's the diet and exercise program or it's the initiative at work. When something becomes part of our routine, it's not hard to do. It's just what we do. So the way we use that simple concept is we take these fundamentals, these behaviors that I was describing, we roll it out into a company in really interactive, engaged sessions, and then we begin to focus on one of these fundamentals each week through a series of rituals. I'll give you an example in just a moment. So week number one, everybody in the company all week long is thinking about working on focusing on fundamental number one. Next week, everybody in the company is focused on number two and the week after number three and four and so on. And we keep cycling through them. So an example, just to illustrate this, of well, what would that look like, is one of the rituals I do in my company, and all of our clients do this, is that we, 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 every time we have a meeting in our company, whether it's a Zoom meeting or an in-person meeting, a project meeting, a department meeting, if we have a meeting in our company this week, every single one of those meetings, the first agenda item of the meeting is the fundamental of the week. And we spend the first three to five minutes talking about it. It's like people saying a prayer before a meal or the national anthem at a ball game. We start a meeting. Every meeting starts with the fundamental of the week. That gives us a lot of chances all week long to think about it, work on it, teach it, focus on it. And that's just one ritual. So we create a number of rituals like that that give us lots of chances all week to teach this principle. Next week, we do that around fundamental number two and the week after three and four and keep cycling through them. So The idea here, if you boil it down to its simple essence, I think of it this way. If you want to get a group of people to behave in some consistent manner, 
whether that group of people is called your employees or the athletes of the team you're coaching or your kids, if you want to get a group of people to behave in a consistent way, doesn't it make sense that you would dramatically improve the probabilities of success if number one, you were crystal clear about exactly what you wanted from them? And number two, if you created a structured, systematic way to teach those behaviors over and over and over and over and over and over again, that would dramatically improve the chances of success. That's all I teach people how to do. And I've just built a system, a methodology, a toolkit, a process for how to do that. And so that just is so simple and so logical to people. They say, yeah, well, why would that work? Of course that would work. It doesn't have to be that complicated. So one of the problems that I have observed is that when culture is introduced, it tends to go a certain way down an organization, if it's a large organization, but getting it to the bottom Mm -hmm. is difficult. And yet it's the bottom that impacts the top. So how have you addressed that issue? Yeah, it's, it's a good observation, Lois. And it's really simple um, because everybody's practicing the fundamentals. So when we roll out, give an example, a couple of weeks ago, we rolled out a set of fundamentals for a, um, a company in Atlanta that it's a mechanical contracting company with about 850 people. Every one of those people, including the guys that are working out, you know, with the greasy pants and working at a job site, you know, this is not for the executives. This is everybody in the company. Because to your point, they're the ones who represent the company out in the field. They're the ones actually working with customers. So they're the most important people. Every one of them went through the rollout process, which is a very interactive, engaged process that all employees go through. And every one of them, every single week is practicing rituals. At the beginning of every day, they talk about their fundamental of the week. There's a mobile app that we created that actually delivers to to all of these people in the palm of their hand tips and suggestions and ideas around this week's fundamental. So everybody in the company every week is talking about and thinking about working on their fundamental of the week. So this is not a program delivered to the executives. This is a program that everybody in the company is practicing. So when you, I, I'm fascinated by this because this is what makes many processes and consultations fall apart. Right? Yes. And people say, well, then it doesn't work. Well, it yes. doesn't work because it wasn't implemented well. Correct. Or it wasn't simple enough for everybody to use. I mean, I think that's yes. why DISC works so well. You yep. have to remember four things. I love DISC for that reason. Most of us can remember four, but eight becomes more difficult, right? Um, So when you're working with companies at that level, you're saying that you initially start by having a formal training process for the employees. Did I hear that correctly? That would be one way to describe it. Yes, I actually call it the rollout. rollout. And the rollout the the way that I like to describe the rollout, because it's a very important part, I often say that we could create the greatest set of fundamentals. And if we haven't engaged the people, it's not going to go very far. They have to be engaged. There's an analogy I like to talk about with the rollout. My analogy is, I think of it like preparing the soil, that if we took really high quality seeds and we threw them down on hard ground and hoped they would grow, they're not likely to go anywhere. If we prepare the soil properly and then we plant the seeds, we have a lot better chance of this thing really growing and nurturing, um, nourishing. So I think of the rollout in a similar way. And so it's very important to the whole success of the program that it get rolled out and introduced to people properly. The rollout that I have learned and created and have done more than a thousand times is a, it's a three hour event, which is a big, it's a, you know, it's a big commitment. And, and we break it down into groups of no more than 40 or 50 people at a time. So if there's 500 people, it might be 10 or 12 sessions, but every single employee goes through it. And it's a three hour, highly interactive, engaged activity with different exercises that give every single employee right down to the lowest level, if we want to call them low, but to the lowest level, it gives every one of them 
the respect and the honor to give them a chance to embrace and explore and understand and talk about these so that by the time they finish that rollout, they're really enthusiastic. They think this is going to be great. And now we've, we've prepared that soil. Now we're ready to start talking about this every week. Now, to your point about things lasting, it still comes down to rituals. If we don't create rituals that become second nature, it isn't going to last. And, and there's, there's a really, I mean, there's lots of examples of this, but here's a classic example. I'm sure you've seen this in companies you've worked with or, or many of your listeners. My experience is that in most companies that are in construction or manufacturing fields, they almost always have safety rituals where every day on a job site, they talk about a safety topic. They sometimes call them toolbox talks, or I've heard called tailgate talks. And every day they do that. And when I talk to CEOs of those companies and I ask them, is that hard to remember to do? They say, no, that's just what we do. Well, that's the ritual. It's the ritual that makes it easy. If they were trying to be disciplined about it, it wouldn't last. It's baked into their routine. It's just what they do. And so you think about if I were comparing two companies and their safety record, one of them every single day in every job site, people are talking about safety and a different one puts a sign on the wall that says, remember to be safe, which one's more likely to have a better safety record? Obviously the first one. We'll think about that then in terms of culture. We could put a sign on the wall with our vision, mission, and values and think, oh yeah, I got that culture thing handled or we could talk about it every single day. If we're talking about it every single day, it's more likely to be living in our people. And we're not gonna talk about it every single day if there isn't ritual around it. If it's trying to remember to do it, we're gonna get busy, life's gonna get in the way. That's why the rituals are so important. How are you measuring success of implementation in an organization? Yeah, it's a good question. There are a number of different ways we can measure success. So there are some subjective measures, well, partially subjective measures. Um, certainly, well, and let me frame it this way. So there are some subjective measures like people's engagement level, people's performance levels, the reduction in drama, things like that. There are also some very objective measures, and those are things like you can look at turnover rates, you can look at your ability to recruit, you can look at efficiency, you can look at productivity um, numbers, you can look at profitability numbers. Now, having said that, I'm always very careful here because I don't think you can isolate the variables. You know, if you're, if productivity increased by 23%, was that because you implemented a culture initiative or was that because, you know, you got rid of a manager who was a problem, or one of your competitors went out of business, or you bought some new equipment that made things more efficient, or any number of things. You did a lot of things at the same time. You didn't hold everything constant, and this was the only change. So I, this is a significant contributor to all of those, but I never like to say that in and of itself is proof of it, because again, we can't isolate the variables. However, there's, I think there's a few things we can say and we can measure. We can certainly say that if you as a leader can identify the behaviors that you know lead to success, we can actually measure whether our people are doing those behaviors more. So there's a survey that we do with, in our own company and lots of our clients where we actually survey customers, vendors and suppliers and employees on each one of the fundamentals. And we ask them in your observation of working with us and your literal interactions with us on each one of these do we almost always, usually, sometimes, seldom, or never do that? And we can actually put numbers associated with those qualifiers. So we can put a number on how well the world who interacts with us says we do at living to these things. And we can measure over time, are we improving the degree of consistency between the things that we claim we do and the things that actually people observe us do um, and see, are we being consistent? So. Certainly, if, if you can tell me as a leader the things that drive success and we can measure that we're doing those things more consistently, it's not a big leap of faith to think that's having a big contribution to your success. There are also some other things we can measure, like I mentioned that, that in our own clients, we use a mobile app that gives them all kinds of ways to interact with their fundamentals. There's, all, there's reporting on every aspect of people's activities in that app. 
So we know whether people are reading it, whether they're watching videos, what, what are they doing in the app? We can run all kinds of reports to, to measure their engagement around that. So when you have pushback from employees, they're not following through, um, what's the process from there? Who, whose job is managing culture? I would say to a certain degree, managing culture usually falls inside the purview of the HR department. Um, that it's the eight because it's it's a people part of the business. It's part of how we're managing our people. And so HR usually has responsibility for the day-to-day implementation management of culture-related issues. Having said that, remember one, it's the CEO who he or she sets what the culture is. So it's led at the executive level. Secondly, it's a day-to-day coaching thing. So if I'm if I'm a line, if I'm if I'm a plant, I'm a, I'm a coach, I'm a, I'm a supervisor in the manufacturing plant. If I've got an employee who's having challenges in living to the behaviors that we say that are important, it's my job to go coach them and not to like wait for HR to get involved or write them up or something. No, this is a, a day-to-day interaction coaching kind of thing. Now, I would also add to this though, Lois, that that we always want to approach the work on our fundamentals from a coaching perspective. So we're not trying to catch people fall short or write people up or discipline people. We're trying to coach people and help them to be this way more consistently. So if we see somebody who's struggling, the first question I would ask is when we say we're getting pushback, so you use that phrase, there's a difference between is the pushback I don't think these behaviors are important or is the pushback I'm uncomfortable in how we're practicing this. So if the issue is they don't think these behaviors are important, I don't think you want them in your company. And these are some pretty basic things like which employee is going to say, wait a second, that honoring commitment stuff. Ah, yeah, you can't make me do that. Or that blameless problem solving. We need more blame in our company. If we could blame each other, this would be a better company. I mean, these are so inherently obviously good that if there was an employee who was pushing back to say, I don't believe in those, you don't want them in your company. Now, if their challenge is the way in which they're practicing them or how how skillful they are at living to these, then that's just a coaching conversation that we want to help them. We believe that they're coming from a position that they want to be this way. They don't always honor their commitments. Well, why is that? Maybe they, maybe they say yes to things too often out of good intention because they want to please and they want to say yes, and they end up overloading themselves with things. And so they're not able to honor all the commitments they made. Well, that's a different kind of coaching call than how come you didn't do what you said you were going to do? Um, or maybe they don't have a good system. Or maybe they didn't feel empowered enough when their boss said, Lois, could you get me this to me by Tuesday? And they knew there was no way it could be done, but they didn't have the wherewithal or the courage or the skill set or the safety to push back and say, time out, Lois, you've asked me for something that's unrealistic. And the result of it is it looks like they're not honoring commitments. So there's a lot more to it. And that's why we want to approach it from a coaching perspective. So David, for you, what's the ideal client? Who do you like working with the most? That's great. I, I, I Well, I love working with entrepreneurs. So the vast majority of our clients are what I would call small to medium-sized clients. And so everyone has a different de- definition of what that means. To me, 10 or 20 employees to 500 employees, that entrepreneur who created his or her company, they're often a founder. Sometimes they're multi-generational. They, you know, they, they've built the company themselves. They now have 40, 50, 60, 70 people. Almost always, they care deeply about their people and their culture. They just have never seen a method to be more systematic about it. So we're rarely taking a a messed up dysfunctional company and making it better. And the reason for that, by the way, is my experience is if it's a, a really messed up dysfunctional company, 
it's because the leader doesn't think that this is important. <laughs> and if the leader doesn't think this is important, they're not going to spend any money to work on it. The only people who work on their culture are people who think it's important. And if they think it's important, they have naturally intuitively done many of the right things. They just haven't been systematic about it. So that ideal client is that small to middle-sized entrepreneurial company with a leader who thinks culture is important, but has just never been that systematic about it. And when they hear about what we teach, they say, oh my God, I'm one of those kind of guys or women. I'm all over culture. I've just never seen a method like this to be more systematic about it. That's the ideal customer. So we will have information about you and your company so people can get a hold of you should they want to get some consulting from you. So those of you who are listening, please um, look for that information in the show notes. But before we, we quit and sign off for today, last thoughts that you would like to leave with the audience that we haven't talked about or covered but are important to cover. Here's, here's what I would leave your audience with, Lois. I have a belief or an observation that most of your audience members' employees come to work every day and they really want to do great work. It matters to them. They really do. I think 95% of them do. But they face two problems that, in my observation, stymie them or become obstacles for them doing their best work. The first is that most of them don't have enough clarity about exactly what great means. Not because they don't care, but because we've not given them enough clarity. We're just frustrated when they're not being the way we want them to be, or we have vague values. And so they don't have enough clarity. I think the second challenge they face is that many of them don't have, most of them don't have the internal personal discipline that it takes to day after day after day, do the things with consistency that lead to success not because they're lazy or don't care, but because that's not how most humans are wired to be. We're not wired to be that disciplined. What, what the system that I teach and that I shared with you here gives them both the clarity to know exactly what great looks like, the fundamentals, and through the rituals, it gives them the structure to within which to practice those things over and over and over and over again with enough consistency to become what I like to call the best version of themselves. What a wonderful gift to give to your team members. Well, isn't that the gift all of us want to be our best version, right? So yeah. how wonderful. David Friedman, thank you so much for being with us today and with our Building My Legacy podcast. And for those of you who are listening, be sure to look at the show notes for information about Culture Wise and David, so that you can get in contact with him. And remember to also visit our website at buildtomorrow.com and all of our social media sites as well. Thank you. Thank my you. pleasure. You've been listening to Building My Legacy podcast with Dr. Lois Sonstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sonstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.